Sitting right here is a participant in the uh, Special Olympics. And she needs some transportation on Sunday afternoons uh, for her sessions from about 3 to 4 in the afternoon. So uh, if anybody is available to help with some transportation for Carol, uh, you can sign up via the midweek reminder. I think there's a link that you can access and sign up for that. Uh, you can also mention it to Marilyn Knopp, and she'll be glad to help um, get you signed up for that. But um, let's support Carol in that respect if we can. So, Carol, we appreciate you and are glad that you can participate in this program. I want to share a message um, this morning. I, I guess I, I usually share in some with some level of fear and trepidation because it's it's really something to stand up front and speak God's word and represent His word. That's uh, quite a quite a responsibility, and I hope I always do have a certain level of fear and trepidation. I have even more a level of that this morning because I just have an unusual burden that what I'm going to share is is kind of an exhortation at admonishment challenge to us uh, to no one any more than myself but um, just pray with me as we uh, consider this word I'm going to share uh, three concepts fundamental concepts I'm going to talk a little bit about assimilation and what it is and why it's relevant to us here today I'm going to talk uh, about our uh, our basic relationship to truth so this is really a basic word and I'm going to share a little bit about discipleship. Uh, three very fundamental concepts, but like I said earlier, truths in which we need to go deeper in the Lord. So please pray with me, and let's just ask God to, to speak to all of us. Father, as we consider your word, please anoint our ears to hear and our eyes to see these crucial issues as they are relevant to each of us. Give us also the conviction we need in order to be decisive and courageous in our commitment to your Lordship over our lives. Lord, we ask for your grace and help to ensure that our foundation is grounded on the solid rock, Jesus Christ, not just in word, but in the substance of our lives. And we ask this in his name. Amen. One of the recurring themes for me is this emphasis on understanding our times, and I have long appreciated this short little um, scripture in First Chronicles that refers to the sons of Issachar, men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. These men were keen observers of their culture, and that was an important part of God giving them discernment to know how they were to most effectively serve the purposes of God, uh, God's will, and to make the most of their lives, to make their lives count for the cause of God's kingdom. And so we, too, today, must be keen students of our times in order to know um, what's going on in our culture, in order to know what Israel, or in this case the church, should do, what God has for us in, in serving the cause of his kingdom. A primary characteristic of our times here in America is what I would consider to be a rather remarkable fracturing and sorting out that's taking place within the professing Christian evangelical culture. Let me illustrate this by some extensive quotes from a Breakpoint article uh, that John Stone Street recently published. So he starts out referencing uh, Jesus' parable of the sower and the seeds, where Jesus referred to seeds which fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Stone Street observes, that rocky soil aptly describes the rapid rise and decline of evangelicals in America in recent decades. Recently, political scientist Ryan Burge, co-authored, co-author of The Great Dechurching, explained how between 1983 and 1993, the share of Americans who identified as evangelicals exploded. 
In fact, at their height in the early 90s, nearly a third of Americans called themselves evangelical. This growth overlapped with the sharpest period of decline for mainline Protestants, which between 1975 and 1988 fell from one in three Americans to less than one in five. As Burge points out, this coincidence was no coincidence. Evangelical gains resulted partly from cannibalizing the mainline denominations. So people just moved from mainline denominations into what, what was referred to as evangelical churches. By 2000, 2000, 2018, however, these gains had withered. Evangelicals returned to their pre-1980s percentage of the population, and by all indications are still declining today, though more slowly. Furthermore, between 1991 and today, the percentage of Americans who identify as religious nuns, and this is mostly in the younger generations, skyrocketed from 6% to 29%. Burge calls this the most significant shift in American society over the last 30 years. And so for me, having lived, and many of you, during these times described by Stone Street, I believe his, um, his observations are quite accurate. And I don't think we can overstate the magnitude of these demographics and their impact on the American church, including the significant decline in church attendance since the pandemic. Stone Street concludes, perhaps given how quickly the evangelical bubble burst, part of the problem was that it was filled with shallow belief. Or to switch back to Jesus' metaphor, perhaps some of the needs or seeds that came up so quickly in the final decades of the 20th century amid chart-topping Christian albums, huge music, festival, music festivals, and sprouting non-denominational megachurches lacked deep roots. Now, it wasn't all this way, but I, I think this is a pretty accurate description, at least from my perspective. Another individual has observed that in many ways, the evangelical community or the movement in America is like 10 miles wide and one inch deep. And it should be the other way around, I believe. Thankfully, there are many exceptions in our churches to this. I believe, for example, that this church is reasonably well-founded in solid Bible teaching. And there are many other churches that way. But sadly, the shallowness that's referenced by Stone Street, I think, is more the rule in the evangelical community than it is the exception. So just here, let me introduce this concept of assimilation. And let me introduce it with this statement. When there is merely shallow grounding in the foundational doctrines of Christianity, assimilation with worldly culture invariably becomes a predominant factor. In simple terms, Britannica Encyclopedia defines assimilation as the process where individuals or groups are absorbed into the dominant culture of a society. And in the case of professing Christians, such assimilation is characterized by the window dressing of religious jargon, forms or formalism, along with church attendance, yet while embracing certain mainstream cultural values, even when these values are contrary to God's word. For example, many prominent evangelical churches avoid taking a decisive stand on the issue of abortion. Have you noticed in many of the so-called red states where there's this affinity between conservative Christianity and republic politics, Republican politics, have you noticed in a number of those states how they have voted to maintain the right to abortion? You know, where's, where's the deep conviction about that among many of the professing evangelical community? 
that's just one example uh, of potentially of assimilation. And even more churches are avoiding addressing gay marriage in the entire sexual identity movement, uh, or even going so far as to actively embrace the gay lifestyle by rationalizing that God, who is love, smiles upon two same-sex individuals who justify their relationship based on the fact that they love each other. I mean, after all, God is a God of love, right? But this is assimilation if we hold it up to God's Word. It was interesting, this past week I, I wrote a blog entitled Drifting Away from the Faith and I addressed this phenomenon of assimilation. A dear brother, I know, he's not a part of this church, but, but someone who's uh, in a local church, emailed me in response and thanked me for the timeliness and the encouragement my blog was to him because he had just submitted his resignation from serving as a staff member in his local church here in our community because the congregation voted to endorse um, their larger denominational position on gay marriage, uh, being pro-gay marriage as a quote-unquote Christian church. And he, he just felt like, in spite of the fact that this was a long-standing church commitment that he'd had, he had many friends there, he'd been on the staff for many years, as painful as it was, he, he, he just concluded, I can't go along with this. I can't endorse this by remaining a part of this. And when I say there's a sorting out taking place, whether it's in churches like this or on the job, there's a brother here who's, who's constantly under pressure to conform with the woke ideology about correct pronouns and that type of thing, and is constantly on the edge of, of deciding what he's going to have to do if he gets pressed too hard on it. I've talked to a number of you in some of your job situations with uh, you know, the whole um, CRT, critical race theory issue. Um, it, it's not just academic. It's not just out there in New York City or San Francisco. It's here in Augusta County as well. So this, this, is, this is something that's coming home to roost even locally. And there's a lot of pressure on uh, professing Christians to conform with the world standards, uh, even when those standards are um, anti-Christian in their, in their values. Now, I... I could make all kinds of qualifications about how God loves the sinner, but hates the sin, and how we need to relate compassionately with all men and women, regardless of their personal persuasions. I won't do that so much this morning because I've done it extensively in other messages. You know, we're, we're in the world. I, I can sit down... Uh, with people who have beliefs that are very different than mine, and, and their beliefs are even contrary, we could say anti-Christian, so to speak. And I can uh, sit down and have a friendly dialogue with them. I can even uh, be friends with them. Uh, and as long as they're willing to dialogue with me and I can be honest with them and so on, I think that's a very health, healthy thing. We're to treat everyone with dignity and respect, regardless of their worldview and their, their particular belief system. But there's a difference between doing that in a loving, compassionate way and at the same time not uh, compromising. As the saying goes, love without truth is compromise. So I've made a little bit more qualification than I planned to make. You know, Christians need to be loving and compassionate toward all men and women regardless of their belief system. But concerning the nature of assimilation, Rod Dreher observes, insofar as we let the culture catechize us and not the precepts of the historic Christian faith, the barbarians or the pagans are us, even if we profess Christ and go to church on Sunday. So this is the fundamental, I believe, of assimilation, leading in turn potentially to apostasy, which means a falling away from the faith. And so again, this, this whole phenomenon that we see taking place in our culture and within the professing Christian community is, is a very sad thing. It's, it's, it's heavy on my heart. 
well, you, you see this, this sorting out taking place. I think God is using it to refine the church. But we are, we are not to compromise when it comes to God's truth. Let me, let me emphasize now this pivotal issue of our mindset toward God's truth um, in what I've just shared in context about uh, what I've just shared about assimilation. And one of the most graphic illustrations of what is at stake is in 2 Thessalonians 2, where Paul says, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved, for this reason, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they might believe what is false, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. I think this drives home the fundamental principle that God's truth and our response to it is essential to our own spiritual well-being and protection. And please carefully note in this verse that Paul doesn't simply emphasize acknowledging his truth or merely giving mental assent to it. Rather, it's significant that our relationship to God's truth is to be one of love. The, the word for love in this particular verse is agape. And it is to be characterized by a heart attitude that passionately loves and pursues God's truth. It's not casual or lukewarm to it. Um, it doesn't set it over here as just another opinion. It's God's truth spoken by the ultimate authority of the universe, God himself. And we are to have this passionate love for that truth. We're to seek it out. We're to give ourselves to it. I like the way the message puts it. Since they refuse to trust truth, they're banished to their chosen world of lies and illusions. It's the logical outcome of not loving the truth. You get what you want. God doesn't force you to go the way he wants you to go, which is always uh, best for us. There's an often overlooked part of this verse um, that I want to point out where Paul says, those all will be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. So another way to think of taking pleasure in wickedness, I believe, is simply endorsing and putting your stamp of approval on that which God defines as evil. And a powerful verse to that effect is in Romans 1, where Paul refers to those who, although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such evil things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. This, this is really staggering, I believe, especially as I think of all those folks in that local church I responded, or I referenced earlier, who basically voted to endorse the gay lifestyle, gay marriage in particular. Paul says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, it's, it's easy in some ways to think of assimilation with the world in rather benign, non-threatening terms. But even when nice religious people who mean well naively embrace values that are contrary to God's truth. They're falling into serious jeopardy, especially if their ignorance is a function of a failure to have a passionate love that seeks out the truth in God's Word. Is that too strong a statement? There are a lot of nice religious people who have opinions about this and opinions about that and opinions about what God should be like and what love is all about and et cetera, et cetera. 
<laughs> but even if they're naive, is their naivete, na naiveness is a result of a failure to passionately love and seek after the truth. Right. And I, I think the scripture says there won't be an excuse for that. That's, right. That's a hard word. There's not going to be an excuse for it. So, in essence, assimilation in embracing worldly values is tantamount to endorsing and giving approval to those who practice evil deeds, as defined in Romans 1. So, assimilation is no minor issue, and it can be the doorway into actual apostasy, falling away from the truth, falling away from the faith. And again, this may seem a hard word, but I believe I'm saying only what the Scripture itself affirms, and I think I'm describing something that is going on all around us. All around us. And we need to understand our times and not get sucked up into these, these types of things. Now, I'm using the sexual identity issue as my primary example. Uh, that's primarily what Paul, the context that Paul was writing about in Romans 1. A, a primary example of assimilation because in our contemporary culture, it's really the tip of the larger spear of the spirit of this age coming against orthodox Christian teaching. I've come to better appreciate that there were some fundamental reasons why the early church, first century church, was persecuted by the larger pagan culture. One of the primary reasons was because they were exclusivists. They only worshipped Jesus Christ. So he is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Whereas they lived in a pluralistic culture that worshipped all kinds of gods. If the Christians had worshipped Caesar along with Jesus, no problem. But they wouldn't. They worshipped only Jesus. That was a primary reason for the persecution. What I didn't realize was that they also lived in a culture of incredible, gross sexual perversions that I won't even describe. That, our, that our, our own culture here in the good old USA today is rapidly approaching the way it was in first century pagan Roman and Greek culture. And another primary reason that Christians were persecuted was because Christianity brought this radical teaching about sexual purity. It brought this radical teaching about the sexual relationship being confined to the one man, one woman marriage relationship. And this went completely against the culture where it was commonly accepted that a Roman citizen, man, would have any number of sexual liaisons in spite of being married. That the wife would just expect that. That was cultural. Or, and this is so gross to contemplate, but the, the man-boy relationships was, was typical in the Roman and Greek cultures. And look, we're headed there now. We're headed there now. There's, there's powerful forces at work wanting to legalize those types of things today. You get away from the scripture, you get away from God as the ultimate authority and his word as his authoritative word, and you start going a different way, this is where you're headed. You're headed back to that pagan first century culture. And we're seeing it all around us today. And, you know, one of the biggest reasons why many Orthodox Christians are persecuted today, those who hold to the biblical standard of sexual purity, is because it goes against the popular cultural trend now toward the, you know, the sexual promiscuity and the LGBTQ plus, you know, movement. We, we, we can't be naive about this. No, we're not narrow-minded, and we're not wagging our finger in judgment at people who have these different sexual mores. But when we stand distinctly for the, the biblical values without being assimilated into the larger culture, we will be persecuted by that culture. You know, a promise we can all claim is the godly will be persecuted. I say that tongue-in-cheek. I don't know if I'll claim that, but it's, it's a reality for 
distinct Christianity that's standing, holding true to the biblical standard. So what is the primary safeguard, or at least a primary safeguard against assimilation? In the simplest of terms, terms, it's cultivating love of God's truth as he defines it, and the norm for this, and it really is the normal Christian life, is characterized by an intentional commitment to discipleship. Discipleship is the progressive movement out of assimilation and conformity with this world into an ever-increasing conformity with Christ. When do you graduate from discipleship? When do you graduate from discipleship 101? Discipleship is a process where we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we might prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Phillips adds, don't let the world around you squeeze it into its own mold. That's assimilation. But let God remold your minds from within. So the bedrock issue here is one of authority. Either God and his word represents the absolute basis for truth, or we will default to our own opinions and preferences as the basis for our so-called truth. And this is the principle behind assimilation, putting my opinion and preferences above God's word. It's that simple. Now, I don't know all, all the time how to interpret this. There are plenty of passages in here I scratch my head at and have to pray about. And maybe when I'm 98, I'll understand everything. But there are some things that is just not difficult at all to understand. And, you know, either I'm going to bow the knee to God and His authority, or I'm not. And if I don't, then I'm going to be prone to assimilation. Here's another way to put it. Discipleship. If you abide in my truth, you're truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Why? Because God's Word is consistent with His creation order. And when we're living consistent with His creation order, we're going to experience freedom. Okay? I think we, we all know that. But here's, here's a, a simple principle, I believe. I'd like you to really think about this. If we are not proactively engaged in discipleship, we likely are drifting. And most drifting is characterized by movement away from something. Now, just think about that. Are we proactively engaged in discipleship? Were you proactively engaged in discipleship for the first 20 years of your Christian life, but you, you, you've arrived and you can sit back and take it easy now? Well, if that's your attitude, you're drifting. And I'm drifting. How many of you, don't raise your hand, how many of you have ever awakened to the fact that you've been drifting? I will raise my hand. So the author of Hebrews says, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention. Look, folks, this is not down the road. We're talking about here and now. We're, we're in hardball right now in our culture. So we must pay. We must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. Could any of us in this room drift away from it? Yes. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense, how much, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Maybe we're not supposed to share scriptures like that um, in, in our church because it might make people uneasy or whatever. No. No, I want what's best ultimately for my own spiritual welfare, and I certainly want that for you, and I want that for this church. So sometimes we share these challenging words. Serious business, much at stake. A casual, half-hearted approach to discipleship simply will not suffice. I'd like to see 
all the opportunities that we have as a church to get together in fellowship with a full understanding that people have busy schedules and other commitments and things like that, we should be taking full advantage of the opportunities, limited opportunities that we have to get together to encourage one another to be in His Word to grow deeper through the process of discipleship. It's not a time to be casual or lukewarm. And I would emphasize again, discipleship is a lifelong process from which we never graduate. And if we're not there in practice, if we're drifting, we need to do some honest self-examination and I'll use this other dreaded word that we don't want to use because it might hurt people's feelings, but maybe we need to repent. Of course, repentance for me is pretty much a daily thing in one aspect of my life or another. I guess that's part of discipleship too, isn't it? But we can't be lukewarm or casual in this season about what's going on. Jesus in Luke, talking about what I believe are the end of the end times, said that the powers of deception out there are so great that if possible, even the elect might be deceived. What does that mean? I don't know, but it's sobering. I do know that. And not something to play around with. I reason that we want to implement this Freedom in Christ course this fall is because of our burden as elders <clears throat> to do everything reasonably possible to help ensure that this church is deeply grounded in the essential truths of our Christian faith. To love the truth with passion and to, to seek to grow deeper in it. So this grounding is essential not only to our own spiritual well-being, but to that of the entire church, as well as our being, potentially being the distinct witness in this community that God wants us to be. Part of the, the witness is we're not legalistic and we're not judgmental to the world around us, but we are distinctly different from the world around us. That's what they need to see. They need to see the love of Christ without being judgmental, but having a distinctly different ethic. They need to see the holiness, the pure, beautiful holiness of God expressed in and through our lives. Not perfection, but more the spirit and attitude. And assimilation with the world is one of the greatest hindrances to what God has for us, because the world looks at us and says, well, they're, they're no different from anybody else. One sentence uh, pretty much describes the goals of the freedom in Christ course, uh, the trailer which you saw earlier, and I, I like this. Most churches use the course to disciple every member, and I like especially this part, no matter how long they have been a Christian, so that a common foundation of discipleship principles is established across the church. Let me, let me also add this observation. I think, I sense, I discern, and we have been praying for years, so why don't we expect this to happen, that we're going to have increasing opportunities to share Christ with people around us in the days ahead. I hope we are. And we need to have the tools, not just to welcome people in so they can become Sunday morning attenders. That's not Christianity. Christianity is discipleship. That's normal Christian life. And so, like the guy said in the video, he was asked to disciple a couple who, who needed some support. One reason you should seriously consider participating in this course is it's fantastic in equipping us in Discipleship 101, giving us a tool that we can use to mentor a younger or newer Christian in the Lord as well. So we don't think about Freedom in Christ course, just what I'm going to get out of it, but also helping better equip me to maybe reach out to others and share Christ with others as well. Again, we didn't just arbitrarily decide to do this. We did talk to our small group leaders and got their support to step back temporarily from the small groups 
small groups can continue to meet if you like, but we just don't want too many meetings, and so we just thought we'd step back for this 10-week period. The first course uh, starts um, the 13th. Thank you very much, Larry. Uh, that's the second Wednesday in September. We'll start 530 with uh, serving a meal, and we'll, so we'll have the additional advantage of getting the church together and just having that fellowship time, getting to know each other better. Uh, details for the course are included on the registration form. Again, we'll provide child care, etc. Um, seems like I'm more and more in the habit when I get to about the third or fourth page of my notes, I just com get completely off of them. So um, I guess you're getting used to that. Um, so we, we as elders have a, a very significant burden for this, and we think this is a very timely thing for our church, if you didn't get that idea already. Um, we just want to encourage you to participate. We, we think this will be um, an excellent time for our church. And now I'm just really repeating myself like a broken record. Let me close with this very sobering exhortation from our Lord Jesus. Because I think, I think this is where we are right now. And he, he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, notice, who hears these words of mine, the word of God, this is the Son of God, yes, this is God the Son, God the Son, these words of mine, and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and burst against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. <clears throat> and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and burst against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Sobering times, we cannot be casual in our need to press in agape love for the truth, to know Christ in a deeper way. Pray with me, if you will. <clears throat> Father, my words are so halting and so meager, but thankfully it doesn't depend on my words. It really is more a function of your Holy Spirit to help each one of us to hear what we needed to hear this morning. And it may be different for each one of us. But our prayer earlier before this meeting was that each one of us would have an encounter with you and that you would encounter us, that you would arrest us, that you would speak to us, that you would put your finger on areas of our lives that maybe need some reconsideration, reevaluation, maybe need repentance, a reordering of our priorities. Lord, you don't shake your fist at us. You don't wave your finger at us in, in condemning us. You're always just gently inviting us to come further in and higher up to grow deeper in our relationship with you. It's to our detriment when we're casual and lukewarm about this incredible privilege of knowing our Creator, the Infinite One. Father, we, we just pray that you will arrest our hearts more fully, capture our hearts more fully for yourself. Where there is resistance, where there is unbelief and slowness of heart, Lord, we ask that you'd melt it away. And by your grace, just draw us more fully into all of the fullness that you have for us, both individually and as a church. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There are registration forms <clears throat> on the stage. I'll put a copy of my notes from the message this morning also on the stage. You will receive an email uh, about the class uh, tomorrow, and you also can register uh, digitally for the class if you want. Let me emphasize also, <clears throat> this is a great opportunity to invite other people, maybe that are not a part of this church, who are seeking, who are interested. This is a great opportunity to invite them to come in and be a part of our fellowship. 
and to hear this uh, this excellent uh, series of, of uh, teachings. Where, where do we put these? Um, you can put them um, in my mailbox or at the front desk or give them to Marilyn. Jim, the chairs over here are to be stacked. How about the ones in the middle? Pardon? Half of them. Half the chairs in the middle in these chairs. Men, if you could stack them back here, we'd appreciate it. Thank you for your patience as I went a bit over time. May the Lord bless each one of you. God bless you.